Nonviolence is the state of perfection. Nonviolence is perfection. Not just an ideal. Nonviolence is not just some sort of ideal. It's the state of perfection. And we see this concept woven into the fabric of creation and into the fabric of redemption. For example, when creation was perfect, creation was nonviolent. Let's reflect upon the dawn of creation. We see a world in harmony. We see a testament to God's perfect, peaceful design. The original state of nonviolence shows us that God in his state of perfection created the world without violence. This is not true in the Babylonian myth stories of creation where there's lots of violence. What's unique about the creation account in Genesis is that the world is created and there is no violence. When creation was perfect, creation was nonviolent. This is true. Eden was perfect. And when Eden was perfect, Eden was nonviolent. In the perfection of Eden, Adam lived in peace with all of creation. And this image of harmony, free from violence, sets the precedent for us in the relationship between what we are supposed to have with the world around us. So when Eden was perfect, Eden was nonviolent. Adam. We are told that Adam was perfect. When Adam was perfect, Adam was nonviolent. Adam's initial state of perfection was marked by nonviolence. His perfect relationship with God, creation, and himself was devoid of violence. And that illustrates the ideal human state as God intended it. Jesus is perfect. And Jesus is nonviolent. So we know that Jesus is perfect, but we also know that he's nonviolent. So Jesus in his perfection embodies nonviolence. His life and teachings offer us a clear model of perfect love and peace and challenges us to follow his example in our pursuit of perfection made possible only by God through the Holy Spirit. The new Jerusalem is perfect and the new Jerusalem is nonviolent. The vision of the new Jerusalem that we read about in the book of Revelation is of a perfect, harmonious city without pain, without suffering, without violence. And this future hope underscores the nonviolent nature of God's kingdom and its perfection. Now, let's go a step further. We say God is perfect. We can know that since God is obviously perfect, that God must be nonviolent. When we connect the dots, we see a clear picture. The perfection of God is inherently nonviolent. This understanding of God's nature invites us to rethink our perspectives on violence and specifically divine violence. So the assertion that I am making to you, what I'm suggesting to you tonight, is that nonviolence is perfection. That using the lens of Christ, we can see that nonviolence is perfection. Viewing God through the lens of Christ's life and teachings, we recognize that nonviolence is not weakness, but it's the perfect strength of God's character. It's the perfect strength of his kingdom. We also see that violence is not perfection. We see that it's not perfection. As we're journeying together now, one truth stands clear above all. Violence is not perfection. It is a deviation from the divine design. It is a disruption of the peace and harmony that is intended for all of God's good creation. In the life and teachings of Jesus, we find no trace of violence upheld as a model for action or for attitude of a follower. Instead, we are invited into a way of living that transcends violence of all forms, physical violence, emotional violence of all kinds. Instead, we embody a love that heals and reconciles and restores. Violence does not look like God. We can say confidently that violence does not look like God. It's clear that violence is a distortion of his character. Violence does not and cannot reflect the true nature of God. Some will say, well, God can be violent because he can do anything he wants, but that doesn't make God bigger. You don't make God bigger by saying he can be violent. That's the way I used to think. I used to think, well, you know, don't take it away from him. Allow God to be able to be violent and, and let him kill his own, you know, his own children. Let's go ahead and say that. Let's go ahead and say that he can do that. 
because that'll make him bigger. And whatever makes him bigger must be better. But let me suggest to you that saying that a father can kill his children doesn't make the father bigger. Instead, in fact, it might actually be derogatory and a trashing of his character. We would never say that a father being able to kill his kids makes him bigger. We would not say the same thing about God. God is our rescuer. He's our keeper. He's the one who comes to save us. He's the one who comes to deliver us from death. He is not the killer. He is not the stealer. He is not the murderer. He is not the destroyer. He is the one who comes to give life and give it more abundantly. He does not kill his children. He saves his children. He redeems his children. He keeps his children. And we do him no favors by accusing him of being a killer. And we certainly run the risk of misinterpreting his character and his nature if we see him as a killer. Violence does not look like God. 